Jim Inkster, and uh, the governor um, had uh, some people greeting him as he entered our studio today, uh, some protesters about the Bayou Bridge project, and we've addressed this many times, the governor has, on this program, and we'll get it out of the way. And if you have questions about other topics, we welcome them, but we got our fill of Bayou Bridge questions last show, and, and this time around, uh, governor, obviously people are passionate about this issue. There are, and, and, and look, I, I understand that, uh, and I think there have been some issues in the past with respect to pipelines, but the bottom line is this. We have refineries along the Mississippi River in the river region of our state, and we are going to get hydrocarbons to those refineries so they stay in business, and we can make sure that individuals remain employed and our country remains fueled. Uh, and the safest way to get those hydrocarbons to those refineries, in my estimation, is by properly constructed, properly maintained pipeline. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we have in, in the uh, pipeline at issue. Uh, and so uh, I understand that people are, are passionate about it, but at the end of the day, uh, I'm going to insist that the permit requirements and the regulations and the law are followed and that we properly install and maintain this pipeline. And, and I think the people of Louisiana are going to be better off for it. And I'm very conscious of the fact that the other ways to get the hydrocarbons to the refineries deal with train and truck, and, and I believe those are actually less reliable in terms of having more wrecks and spills and, and accidents. And so we're working through this. I, I expect that, the, based on the information that I have, that the pipeline will be completed sometime before the end of the year. Well, on another topic, uh, the president has imposed some tariffs, uh, and a week ago you fired a letter off to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, what are your thoughts about how these tariffs will affect Louisiana? Well, I'm hearing from folks around the state, uh, particularly those associated with our ports, which are the busiest they have ever been, and, and they uh, mean so much to our economy and to the jobs that are supported directly and indirectly, but also with respect to agriculture, especially around soybeans and corn and other grains that are produced here. Uh, and then you also have uh, industrial expansion and, and investment like the LNG plants that require so much steel, uh, and the cost of those projects uh, will potentially increase uh, by as much as 20 percent or so. And uh, the other day, Blooming, uh, Bloom, I'm sorry, Bloomberg actually put out a report that says of all the states, Louisiana could potentially be affected uh, the most adversely. Uh, and so the letter to the president was just pointing out all these things and asking him uh, to the best of his ability to bring these negotiations uh, to a successful conclusion sooner rather than later. I mean, we understand the, the concept around short-term pain for long-term gain. We just want to make sure that, that uh, the, the painful part uh, is minimized, both in, in the extent uh, with respect to, to how much pain and also the duration. Uh, and so I asked him to please make sure that to the extent possible that uh, we get these negotiations concluded and, and not visit this harm upon uh, the agriculture sector and the ports and, and uh, the industrial expansion that we have going on in Louisiana. Now, Attorney General Jeff Landry, uh, prior to uh, you arriving here today, uh, just prior, uh, sent out a message saying that uh, a letter to you, uh, Louisiana currently has over 70 inmates on death row awaiting execution. The state's not carried out a sentence since 2010. He says even though a large and growing number of victims' families suffer in legal limbo, and he goes on to say uh, that uh, he has uh, ordered his office to withdraw from further representing the Department of Corrections in a case, Hoffman versus Jindal, the pending constitutional challenge to the three-drug execution protocol. Your thoughts on this? Well, you know, it's unfortunate that he would withdraw, and, and certainly he hasn't tried to contact me, uh, to my knowledge. He hasn't called me or texted me or, or worked through my office. But at the end of the day, uh, the Louisiana law statutorily prescribes a method by which we would have to administer any execution. It requires a drug cocktail. Those drugs are not available. And absent uh, some change in legislation, for example, uh, those drugs cannot be made available. And so we're, we're just not capable of uh, executing someone in accordance with the law. And that's why the federal court has imposed stays in the past. And by the way, um, last year, the Attorney General's office actually joined in uh, the petition to the court for the stay. Uh, and the facts haven't changed uh, since then. Um, so it it's unfortunate. I'm not exactly sure. I'm 
I'm hopeful that uh, I can visit with the attorney general and find out exactly what his concerns are because I, I don't understand uh, the, the letter that he released today. You have clashed with uh, the attorney general or he has clashed with you on, on any number of fronts. Uh, it, does that make it uh, difficult to work with each other? Well, actually, I mean, obviously it's more difficult than it should be um, and, and that I would like it to be. But we have had um, many opportunities to, and that we've taken advantage of to talk about things on the phone or in person. Uh, and, and I have no uh, problem sitting down with him talking about this particular issue either. Uh, I, I would just point out that he issued this release today without having tried to contact me at all. And, in fact, I don't believe there has been any communication from him or his office to me or my office about this matter since about October of last year. 877-217-5757. James in Longview, Texas. You are our first caller today, and it's nice to hear from James. Hi there. Well, good afternoon, Jim, and good afternoon, Governor Edwards. Hi, James. How are you? I'm doing fine. Anyhow, I was just in your fine state a few days ago. I went to Ajax, Louisiana, just south of Shreveport, and really enjoyed the drive. Anyhow, getting to my question, I read about the $60 million allocation of funds from the the oil spill settlement uh, for coastal projects, Governor, and I was just wondering, do you know approximately when the these projects might start and about how many years will they continue and will any projects be upriver such as dredging or do you even know? Yeah, well, no, I do know. And and this is $60 million that came from uh, the Deepwater Horizon BP settlement. This is the Natural Resources uh, Damage Assessment uh, Funds called NERDA. Uh, it's $60 million total, but, but the purpose of these funds is specifically for recreation. Uh, and it has to be spent along the coast. Uh, and so we've been working for two years to finalize a list of projects that happened. Uh, and there were uh, some 350 uh, projects that were actually recommended to us. Uh, but but we picked, we narrowed it down and we're going to move forward. And I'll answer the rest of that when we come back. Uh, the governor in his uh, entrance to the building today was greeted by a number of uh, protesters involving the Bayou Bridge project. And... Uh, uh, last time we did a show, we had a number of questions about Bayou Bridge, and uh, let, let's save uh, any future inquiries for another time and get on to other matters, even though this is a very important one. The governor did address it in the first segment, and James in Longview was our first caller governor, and he had a question on another matter that you were addressing as we went to the break. Yeah, it has to do with uh, $60 million that we are going to invest in recreational opportunities along our coast that come from the Deep Water Horizon oil spill settlement. These are NERDA dollars. Uh, they have to go towards recreation. And we picked 23 projects uh, in nine different parishes along the coast uh, with a big emphasis on wildlife and fisheries, but also uh, state parks. But we also picked a project uh, with the U.S. Department of Interior at Jean Lafitte uh, Park and, and also the Chittimacha tribe down in St. Mary Parish. We're also going to enhance, I think it was 11 artificial uh, reef structures uh, out in the in the Gulf uh, from one end of the uh, state to the other out along the coast. And so this is important. And the good thing is the, the money is all funded. Uh, and so we're able to do the design and the planning, but also the construction. So it's not broken up into phases. And to the, one of the questions James had was, how long is this going to take? And each project is of, is of a different character. Uh, but within the next two or three years, these projects should all be complete. Mary in New Orleans, I, I take that back. We'll go to Chuson in New Orleans as our first caller. Chuson, you're on t on the Ask the Governor with Governor John Bell Edwards. Hi, Chuson. Yes, are you there? Hello? Yes, you're on the air. Uh, it's Justin in Baton Rouge. Okay, well, I, I have the wrong information, but please continue. Uh, Governor Justin DeWitt, uh, just calling to uh, say, ask uh, the importance of the 2019 elections for in regards to the Jer uh, sorry, gerrymandering, the redistricting in uh, 2020. Do uh, you view that as a very important subject matter for the upcoming 2019 elections and legislature? Right. Well, Justin, thank you for the call. Um, as you probably know, Justin, the, the census is required every 10 years. It happens uh, in the even numbered year. So in 2020, there will be a new census. Uh, following the census, there's always a redistricting, sometimes you call it a reapportionment, uh, that has to go through the legislature with respect to things like the legislative districts, uh, 
both in the House and the Senate, but also the congressional seats. And I think it's always important uh, that uh, you have fair maps that actually represent uh, the makeup of the electorate. And so uh, I do believe that it's, it's important, uh, and I believe it's important that you have a good working relationship uh, with the House and the Senate and the governor's office to promote a fair map, uh, one where the, the voters choose their representatives and not the other way around. And, and right now, uh, th this young man I know is running for uh, the sixth congressional seat. That 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 seat has uh, part of the New Orleans. Well, it has uh, Baton Rouge in it, and it, it goes all the way through South Louisiana. And the uh, North Baton Rouge part is now part of the New Orleans district, represented by Cedric Richmond. Is that the way it should be in an ideal world? Well, I'm not sure that that any of our maps uh, in Louisiana and, and most states around the country actually have ideal districts uh, mm -hmm. in them. Uh, and, and so it, I think it is important to kind of take a step back and, and take a deep breath uh, and then try to figure out what's fair to the voters uh, so that you have districts whose lines are not just meandering all over the place. Um, and, you know, hopefully we will be able to promote that uh, level of fairness uh, in uh, the redistricting process next year. Mary in New Orleans. Hello, Mary. You're on Ask the Governor with Governor John Bell Edwards. Hi, Governor. How are you? I'm doing fine, Mary. Thank you. Thanks. I wanted to um, um, call and um, thank you and your wife for putting in the substantial effort, efforts that you have into uh, addressing needs of um, disabled individuals and making Louisiana. Okay. I, I tell you, we're having some difficulty understanding you, Mary. Uh, we'll try to get you to a better place and... Uh, We'll see if we can uh, improve the connection between uh, you and our listeners. Uh, but he was thanking you and your wife, and um, I'm sure you, anytime the First Lady is mentioned, I see the governor smile. Well, I do, and, and I'll tell you, she, she works very hard, and she does a great job. She's a very passionate person. She loves our state and, and our people, and that especially comes through with respect to education and students and, and putting music, art, and movement uh, in our schools and emphasizing those, but also with respect to the foster program in the state of Louisiana and promoting the foster program and adoptions out of the foster program. She works very hard and, and, uh, and I think she, she accomplishes a lot working with uh, uh, folks like Marquita uh, Walters at the, mm -hmm. uh, at the Department of Children and Family Service, but also a lot of other individuals around the state who are very passionate about that. So I'm proud of, I'm proud of Don. Of course, I've known her for many, many years. I'm 50, almost 52 now. And, uh, and I met Donna back when I was about 12 years old and, <laughs> about 14 or 15 is when I started uh, uh, chasing her around. Now, uh, with the fiscal cliff being uh, resolved, uh, where do you go from here? Uh, are, are we looking at uh, systemic change, or is that possible? Well, what we have now, and, and, and I think it's a blessing for our state, is for the first time in a number of years, we actually have stability, predictability in our budgeting process uh, and in our revenue, and, and this has already paid dividends. For example, the credit rating agencies have already removed uh, the negative watch uh, because anytime we down, we're downgraded, it costs us more uh, just to service the debt we already have, and any new debt is obviously going to cost more as well. But we were able to fashion a responsible budget, one that uh, actually is based on a reduction in the net tax burden of almost $600 million from last fiscal year to this year, the start of July 1st, when the fifth penny of sales tax that was added a little over two years ago was actually cut by more than half. Uh, and we, we cut about $200 million of state general fund expenditures out, but we did that surgically. Uh, and as a result, we were able to fully fund higher education, for example. We were fully able to fully fund TOPS. Uh, our health care in Louisiana is adequately funded. And so I believe we have the stability, the predictability that we need to maintain the momentum that we've seen uh, over the last year and a half, especially with respect to economic development projects, with respect to uh, job creation, and, and the, uh, the fact that last year not a single state in the nation exceeded our decline uh, in unemployment here in Louisiana. So I feel good about where we are, and, and uh, we will have the stability to go forward, I think, in a in a much sounder way, uh, and and I'm excited about the opportunities that we have to to serve the people of Louisiana now. Roy in Luling, hi Roy, you're on the governor. Ask the governor with Governor John Bell Edwards. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for my call. Thank you, Roy. Um, uh, quick question, Governor. I'm a CDL driver. How does the LA Wallet Act 
with us that have to carry the medical card in order for the CDL license to be um, fully valid. Roy, uh, thank you for the call. I'm not sure that I have the answer to your question. So before you get off, please give your information to Micah. Uh, and we will have uh, Karen St. Germain, who runs the Office of Motor Vehicles, give you a call. But there are probably a lot of listeners out there who are not yet familiar with the L.A. Wallet. And uh, you can actually have an electronic version of your driver's license on your smartphone now. Uh, and that uh, is good for as long as your license is valid. So until it expires... Uh, there is an app that is required for this. It's L.A. Wallet. Uh, it costs $5.99, uh, but, but this allows you to have that, that uh, driver's license. Uh, sometimes it's a little more convenient, uh, and it will be accepted by law enforcement. Uh, it is not yet, as I understand it, accepted by TSA at the airport, and we're, we're working on that. Uh, and we are working to make sure that restaurants and bars and that sort of thing acknowledge that this is a valid form of ID. Uh, but this is uh, groundbreaking. We're the first and only state in the nation uh, to have this as an official form of state-issued identification. Uh, and it seems to be very popular, especially with the young people. Now, with respect to driving license requirements for CDL, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have that information on me. But if you would please stay on, give your information to Micah, we will get you that answer, and maybe I can bring that back and share it with the wider audience on my next visit to uh, this radio program. All right. Let's go to Doug in Baton Rouge. And, Doug, you're on with Governor John Bell Edwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Governor. I um, wanted to follow up on your uh, very clear description of, uh, you know, the budget resolution, which turned out really for the better despite all the uh, difficulties. But a lot of your opponents are uh, claiming that um, you, they're saying you, even though the legislature voted on this, raised taxes. And um, they keep saying it, so I'm hoping you'll help clarify that. <laughs> well, Doug, uh, thank you for the call. And, yeah, they, they, you know, my opponents are going to have to say something. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at the tax burden uh, that the state had last year uh, that, that ended on June 30th, and compare or contrast that to the burden uh, that for the fiscal year that started July 1st, there was a net redac reduction of that tax burden by almost $600 million. And that is because the primarily because the sales tax uh, went, the state portion of it went from 5% to 4.45%. Uh, so that's the fact of the matter. Uh, and uh, not only did it go down, uh, the legislature saw fit to make sure that, that we have some stability, so they put a seven-year horizon on this, which I think is going to be uh, beneficial, uh, and we're going to be able to move forward and adequately fund our priorities. For example, higher education. You know, just for the second time in 10 years, we funded higher education without a reduction and fully funded the TOPS program, and that's going to mean an awful lot for our state and our ability to continue to attract investment and create jobs because we are going to have the educated, skilled, trained workforce that employers and, and investors are looking for in order to expand their operations in Louisiana or to, to uh, invest here in the first instance. So I'm excited about the stability, but the fact of the matter is the tax burden went down from last year to this year. Uh, they can say what they want to say, but everybody in the state knows it because when you go and buy something, look at your receipt and compare it to what uh, mm -hmm. that receipt would have been back in June. Jennifer in Baton Rouge. Hi, Jennifer. You're on Ask the Governor. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for taking my question. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you. Um, so my question is about our um, voting process here in Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana is only one of five states uh, whose voting machines don't include a paper trail, and we know that Russian hackers breached our system in 2016. So I guess I want to know, do you believe that there's a credible threat of Russian meddling or other type of hacking into our elections here in Louisiana? Well, first of all, I'm not going to second guess the national security establishment. I think there have been about 17 uh, intelligence agencies that have said that there is a real active threat, and there are signs that uh, they would like to um, hack into our election system uh, this year and in 2020. Uh, so I'm not going to second guess that. I will tell you, I know that our Secretary of State and the Elections Division is working very hard to safeguard our system. Uh, and uh, they are, in fact, in the process of purchasing brand new uh, voting machines. Uh, and as far as where they are and what all the features of those machines are going to be uh, when they're in place, 
Um, I'm really not able to answer that uh, at this moment. Uh, I would encourage you to contact uh, the Secretary of State's office and Kyle Ordwan, who, who is the uh, Interim Secretary of State, uh, and, and address those questions to him, and, and I will make it my business as well uh, to contact him and, and uh, make sure I under, understand exactly what new features are going to be incorporated into the machines that he's purchasing. Governor, before we go back to the phone lines, uh, you mentioned you had full faith in uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, earlier this week, of course, the president made news when he implied that he did not have full faith in it. Uh, w what are your thoughts about the controversy that's swirling about the president of the United States? Well, first of all, I, I believe that Russia is not our friend. Uh, I believe that they seek to do us harm. Uh, and I think we're all uh, benefited when the president speaks with a very clear, uh, strong uh, voice on this and, and, uh, and one that is consistent. And, and th that obviously hasn't uh, been the case here lately. And, and obviously I'm, I'm hopeful that, that he and the administration uh, will find that voice uh, in the very near future. 877-217-5757. Jennifer in Lafayette. Good afternoon, Jennifer. You're on the air with Governor John Bell Edwards. Hey, good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Jim. Hi, Thanks Jennifer. for taking my call. Um, Governor, I have a quick question for you. First, um, I applaud you for signing the abortion legislation that you just did. Um, and I think I remember you saying that you were waiting on a decision from the Fifth Circuit Court, was it, about whether or not we we're going to begin enforcement? Um, could you could you either correct me if I'm mistaken and or update me if um, uh, on on what you meant with the with the status of that and I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you. Now, Jennifer, thank you for the call. Uh, the legislation that I signed is uh, virtually the same as legislation that uh, previously was put into place by the state of Mississippi, uh, and that legislation uh, is currently. Uh, being contested in federal court, and it will work its way through the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, and because we are in the same uh, circuit uh, as Mississippi, that ruling will be uh, binding on us as well. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, at the time I made that statement, uh, the uh, statute uh, in Mississippi uh, had been enjoined, and so it was not put into place pending the outcome uh, of the litigation. Uh, so what I said was I expected that our legislation would have a similar uh, road to travel before it would become effective. Jim in Covington. Good afternoon, Jim in Covington. You are on Ask the Governor with Governor John Bell Edwards. Hi, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Governor Edwards, I had a question for you. And I was curious if the possibility of Senator Kennedy running against you has changed your strategy? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I'm, I'm focused on doing my job uh, as governor to the very best of my ability. Uh, I'm uh, focused only on that, uh, and, and that is my strategy, by the way, to be reelected, and it's the best strategy there is because right now I don't have a clue who my opponent is going to be. I know someone or multiple individuals are going to run. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you run for re-election, the question people will ask themselves are, are we better off than before uh, the current governor was elected? And I think the answer to that for the vast majority of people uh, is yes, and it will be yes on election day. Uh, and because it's, it's true in so many uh, significant and profound ways, uh, so uh, whether or not Senator Kennedy runs won't change my approach to how I do my job, and, and doing my job to the best of my ability is the strategy to be reelected. Nancy in Denham Springs. Hi, Nancy. You're on Ask the Governor with Governor John Bell Edwards. Hello, Governor. Thank you for your service. Hi, Nancy. Thank you. I have a question about teacher retirement and Social Security. Yes, ma'am. Uh, teachers are penalized if they've worked for the state and for private schools. We are not allowed to get Social Security that we put in and our employer put in for those 40 quarters. What is the likelihood that the legislature would change that uh, requirement? Nancy, I believe that the, the issue that you have is one 
uh, that would require Congress to change. They have what they call, I believe, the Windfall Elimination Act, uh, and Social Security is a is a federal creature, uh, and so changing legislation there, I believe, would be required. As you know, the state decided decades ago that we would not put our teachers and our state workers into the Social Security system, um, and any change uh, with respect to uh, uh, the eligibility for Social Security for state workers and teachers who are currently not eligible uh, would would require uh, legislation to be passed by Congress and signed by the President. Um, that is my understanding, and by the way, this has been an issue that I've heard about uh, since before I, I became a legislator, uh, and, and I'm quite certain that I'm correct on that. Uh, however, Nancy, if you would give your information to Micah so that we can contact you again, I will make sure that someone calls you uh, and gives you more specific information about that. Thank you, Nancy. Jenna in Baton Rouge. Hi, Jenna. You're on Ask the Governor with Governor Edwards. Hi, Governor. Thank you for Hi, taking Jenna. my question. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, Jenna. Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Uh, so I'm wondering if you're going to be willing to use eminent domain to get St. James an evacuation. All right. Uh, uh, do you want to answer that? Well, it's it's not something that I've even considered up to now, and... Uh, and, you know, I've had so many conversations with local elected officials and citizens of St. James Parish, um, and this is not something that they've told me uh, is a concern of theirs. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm willing to look at making sure that, that uh, whatever might need to be done there uh, is, is, in fact, considered. As we mentioned, the governor began uh, this program in April of 2016, and uh, it is hard to believe. I remember when you were running for governor, it seems like yesterday, and that's been three years now since uh, you were in a runoff with David Vitter. Uh, how have those three years been for you? You know, it, it is a very rewarding experience for me and for Don and for the kids, but to have the opportunity to wake up every day. Uh, and to go to work on behalf of the people of Louisiana, who I think are the greatest people uh, in the country. Um, you, you know, Jim, we're governors are introduced as the governor of the great state. Well, I am the governor of the great state of Louisiana. What makes it greater is people. And, and the opportunity to work and do the things that I said I would do on their behalf and, and to overcome the challenges. You know, we, we did expand Medicaid, and it's working in Louisiana. It's benefiting so many people. We've... we've uh, We've, we've enacted criminal justice reform on a scale that is critically important to our state. Uh, we're making sure that we're landing the biggest economic development projects in our state's history, and, and unemployment is declining. In fact, we have more people working than ever in, in Louisiana. So to be able to get up and do those things, and look, I know we have a lot more challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I have to keep, get up every single day and work as hard as I can. Ricky in Alexandria. Hi, Ricky. You're on the air with Governor Edwards. Uh, hello, Governor Edwards. Hi, Ricky. Uh, I just want to say I think you're doing an outstanding job, and I salute you being a per former uh, serviceman. I worked for DOD for several years, and now I'm working for the Veterans Administration. Well, thank you very much for your work. And uh, I just, uh, again, I, I was blessed to meet you uh, when they dedicated the new VA hospital in New Orleans, and I, I just think you're doing an outstanding job, sir. Thank you so much, Ricky. Uh, my question, sir, and I, I've had uh, several people that uh, go to casinos and things, and uh, I've had several people ask, you know, when the, when, when the bill was at, passed to let casinos come into Louisiana, that, you know, they were going to make all these big contributions to the state. And uh, is there... I mean, is there a, a website or just see just what are they contributing or the, you know, uh, like I said, you, they were supposed to. All right. Yeah, well, Ricky, uh, absolutely. You can see um, exactly how much revenue we collect from c casinos. And when you say casinos, I don't know whether you mean the 15 riverboat licenses, the, the one land-based casino, and sometimes people talk about video poker uh, being casinos as well. Uh, and it was video poker specifically that when created, um, uh, the revenue was going to go uh, to education in large part. And I can tell you that that does happen. Everything that was required to, uh, to go to uh, education does, in fact, go there. Um, but you can go to the Department of Revenue, and we'll get you some information uh, 
as to exactly uh, who you can speak to. But but Rick, if you hang on and talk to Michael, we'll do that. Mm-hmm. And and they they can walk you through what the revenue is from each of those areas uh, of gaming, and especially those that were earmarked for specific purposes, such as education, as it relates to uh, video poker. Do you think there will be a, a move soon for sports? gaming in Louisiana? Oh, I, I think so, because what, what uh, you know, we already see that the, the Supreme Court ruled recently that, that uh, uh, the federal government couldn't limit it just to uh, the one state in Nevada, and Mississippi's already moving forward, and so you're going to have a competitive disadvantage in Louisiana if that's not addressed, and so I think you're going to see some legislation in the upcoming session. And John Bell Edwards is in the House for another quarter hour, 877-217-5757. Uh, the governor's an avid sports fan, and we're about six weeks away from college football. But last night, two LSU stalwarts uh, were strong performers in the Major League All-Star game with Aaron Nola sh- uh, throwing one shutout inning for the National League and Alex Bregman uh, winning the game and being named the most valuable player for the American League. Uh, two guys who played together were roommates at one time. Yeah, and I'll tell you, they, they're ex- extremely good athletes, but they're, they're great people as well, and they represent our state and LSU uh, so well, and obviously uh, at the top of the game. Uh, as you just mentioned, you know, these are the all-stars, so this is the best of the best, and, and uh, the MVP went to Alex Bregman, so congratulations to him, and obviously the, uh, the Astros won the uh, World Series as, as well last year. Yes, so. indeed, and, and you like going to uh... – Football games, LSU, I do, I do. Saint. LSU. I, you know, I grew up an LSU fan. Of course, I went to LSU Law School, and, and so I am a Tiger. Uh, I like to support all of our uh, universities around the state of Louisiana, uh, but I am particularly partial to the LSU Tigers. And you and Coach O have had quite a bond in the early going. We have, and, you know, we just had a chance meeting at a, at a duck camp in South Lafouche Parish about a year and a half ago, and we're able to talk, and, and a friendship grew out of that. And I will tell you, his – Infectious enthusiasm uh, is is just something to behold, and and it is go Tigers, twenty four seven with uh, Coach O, and and uh, I'm obviously excited about this year, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the Tigers uh, can do, and and get a test right out of the gate with the uh, game against Miami in Dallas mm-hmm. uh, Labor Day weekend, and Miami one of the premier programs in the country right now, and so that's going to be a big test, and. And obviously, I'm excited about it. And, and if the Tigers can win that, uh, I think they're on course for a great season. John McKithen used to offer plays to Charlie McClendon. Have you gotten <laughs> to that point? Have you offered any plays to No, sir. I, w- I, would, I would not feel comfortable trying to do that. But you did play in your day for I, a mighty I did. meet. I did and enjoyed it. I, I played all four years, and, and I started uh, uh, three years, but the last two at quarterback. And it, it was it was a lot of fun. And, and you know, a meet is a – is a pretty good sports uh, school, mm-hmm. and, and especially as it relates to football. In fact, I think the highest-rated player in the country at defensive end is at Amit High School this year. And the young man who scored the winning touchdown for Alabama yeah. in the yeah, championship I don't like game. talking about him because he went to Alabama. I needed him to come to LSU. Ethan from Lafayette. Ethan, good afternoon. You're on with the governor. Hello there, Governor. Uh, yes, I uh, like they said I am a proud resident of Lafayette and a proud UL uh, guy, you know, a yes, current sir. student there. I'll forgive your LSU uh, enthusiasm <laughs> there. Look, I'm, I'm enthusiastic I'm about all of our schools, including the Raging Cages. That's true, actually. Yeah. That's true. And actually, I wanted to thank you for showing so much respect and uh, regard for UL, including coming down here recently and being here during your campaign. Yes, sir. Uh, but. My question was in regards to raising revenue. Now, I know that that's always taxes and stuff are always a big uh, political flashpoint in the state. Yes, sir. Uh, and my personal opinion on taxes has been I don't mind them. I don't mind paying them. I'm fine with them. But I've always thought that the more regressive taxes like uh, sales taxes, I'd much prefer rather to have property tax than income taxes. As a taxpayer, I, you know, I prefer having it taken out of my paycheck rather than paying it every time I go buy something. And it's been shown that those are sales taxes can be paid more by the poor rather than income taxes, which are more progressive. So I was wondering if there's any possibility we could potentially replace some of those sales taxes with income or property tax. Well, uh, Ethan, thank you very much for the call. And uh, I wish you the best of luck. With respect to to revenue, look, it is a difficult subject matter. Uh, we had a 
period of two years where uh, the legislature created a task force to study and make recommendations about tax reform, long-term structural tax reform. That uh, all-star blue ribbon panel met many times, made recommendations, all of which were before the legislature in the regular fiscal session of last year in 2017, and then again in the first special session of 2018, none of which uh, moved out of the House of Representatives. So at the end of the day, we came back uh, to the sales tax, which fortunately we were able to reduce the fifth penny uh, to 0.45 of a penny. Uh, and, and it is regressive by its nature, but the one thing I'd ask you to consider, Ethan, it is the least regressive sales tax in the country because it does not apply to food for home consumption, so groceries. It does not apply to uh, pharmaceuticals uh, and it does uh, prescription drugs, and it does not apply to residential utilities. Three things that are obviously uh, requirements for anyone. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, our sales tax in Louisiana, the state sales tax, is not nearly as regressive as sales taxes elsewhere. And in fact, those three exemptions add up to more than $1 billion. Uh, so I'd just ask you to keep that in consideration. But, but we are going to have a stable source of revenue now that is going to allow us uh, to adequately fund higher education going forward, uh, this year and going forward, as well as not just the institutions, but as well as uh, the TOPS and um, GO grants. So need-based aid for higher education students is also funded, uh, a, I think, $2 million more uh, than has ever been the case in the past. So, so we prioritize education. We know it's important for our state's future. It provides opportunity for people such as yourself. Uh, and the sales tax, unfortunately, uh, is a big component of the revenue necessary to make sure that that happens. David in New Orleans, good afternoon. You're on with Governor Edwards, David. Governor Edwards, man, it's an honor. I am a Loyola Wolfpack Jesuit, and uh, <laughs> I will tell you again, uh, uh, just an honor. Uh, my expression, I made it up. Give them hell, John Bell. Put on every T-shirt, every button. So you Thank show you, David. all those guys from Jeff Langer to Roger Villery, who my governor is. I will tell you, Governor, that um, uh, I want you to reach out and speak to public employees from Sheriff deputies to parole officers, drug counselors, um, they're still paid low. Public employees matter. And as the teachers showed around the country, as you know, we got to get those salaries up. And still people are afraid of high salaries or afraid of talking about union. But can you, can you say something to that about, about increasing uh, salaries for um, public employees across well, David, first of all, thank you for the call, and I appreciate your enthusiasm. I do speak to public employees quite often, um, and, and you know, my mother was a state employee. She worked at a charity hospital as a registered nurse. Uh, my wife uh, is a school teacher. Uh, one of the things that I've already announced as, a, as the number one priority uh, next year will be uh, a teacher pay raise as part of increasing uh, the MFP, uh, the formula by which we fund K-12 education. Uh, but public employees uh, do deserve, on occasion, pay raises. They weren't getting them for a long time. And you end up in a situation where you have a very high turnover. And so the costs associated with training and recruiting and replacing, but also paying overtime uh, to the state workers that you have, actually can become more expensive than if you just give a moderate uh, increase in pay uh, on occasion. Uh, and we've been able to do that, uh, and, and in fact, uh, a 2% raise for, for most state workers uh, around the state. And, and I will tell you, uh, they are very appreciative. Even though it's, it's, it's meager and it's the first raise in, in many years, uh, they do appreciate that raise, and, and I appreciate state workers. Susan in New Orleans. Hello, Susan. You're on the air with Governor Edwards. Hi, Governor. I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, as a devout Catholic, I'm wondering how you reconcile um, people in St. James. All right. Uh, we've been there. I think we know what this is about, and we've addressed Bayou Bridge. Let's try Ray in Prairieville. Hi, Ray. You're on the air with Governor Edwards. Thanks for taking the call, Jim, and uh, uh, thank you to Governor. Thank uh, you, Ray. I have to reiterate what the two of the three previous uh, callers said. I'm in favor of doing away with the uh, or minimizing the regressive sales tax and getting a better corporate income property tax system 
what's pretty much what the Stelly uh, system did. Yeah, Ray, uh, first of all, I appreciate the call. Uh, I happen to think that there is a better way um, uh, to uh, get the revenue that the state needs. And, and in fact, I embraced uh, most of the uh, recommendations that came from the legislatively created task force. Uh, however, at the end of the day, there simply is not the will in the legislature to move in that direction. Uh, revenue issues require a two-thirds vote, which makes it uh, uh, incredibly difficult if, if it is a contentious issue. Uh, about which there is a lot of disagreement. Um, and so at the end of the day, we, we're going to keep the system that we have. The, the, the improvements, however, is that it is a lower sales tax than it was before. All of the exemptions, uh, constitutional exemptions, remain fully uh, in place, uh, and we're going to have more stability uh, going forward. Uh, so we're in a much better place than we were. It's not the best possible outcome, uh, but it's one that, that uh, I am... Uh, moderately proud of anyway because I think it was the best result we could get under the circumstances and we are going to be uh, better off because of the predictability the stability that we're going to have and our ability to invest uh, in critical priorities without having to cut health care and education the two areas uh, that people all across the state of Louisiana told me they specifically did not want to cut uh, the, those areas uh, are in the budget in a responsible way and they will be going forward as well well, thank you, Governor John Bell Edwards, on program number 28 of Ask the Governor, and uh, Governor will be back next month. And until then, thank you for listening. We're glad you're a Louisiana person, and if you're not, uh, certainly we're even more pleased that you're interested in this state and the governor's abilities to run it, and uh, thank you for calling. Thank you, Jim.